that rivalry uh, was there in regards to like Army and Navy, like, like Zama and Yokosuka, like Zama and Yokosuka. Mm. Um, but a lot of the Navy kids were friends with the Yokosuka kids because, you know, their dads actually worked together. It's just that, you know, some dads lived in Mitsugi and some dads lived in Yokosuka, you know. So, but for us, it was, I think back then, at least, the, the rival was between Zama and Yokosuka in regards to football. Um, okay. yeah, so, uh, there was a lot of competition, a lot of, a lot of drama <laughs> amongst the coaches and even amongst our coach and even the, the sports writer for the stars and stripes, you know, like, yeah, <laughs> I heard some stories about that, you know, drama going on, but yeah, it, it was definitely there for sure. Welcome to the Tokyo alumni podcast, episode 68. Our guest today was born in Honolulu, Hawaii, being part of a military family who moved around within the States and then to Korea and finally to Japan for a long-term residency at Camp Zama. He attended the John O. Ern Elementary School located in Sagamihara, eventually transitioning to Zama High School. During his time at Zama, he participated in varsity football and the JROTC program. Following his graduation from Solano College in 2008, he transferred to California State University, Sacramento to work on his bachelor's in psychology. Through the Army Reserves, he was selected to participate in the simultaneous membership program, where he would eventually contract as an ROTC cadet to work towards becoming an Army officer. As many have experienced the hardships at the time, he decided to withdraw from both the college and the ROTC program to take what was to become a long-term break in 2011. Upon Upon completion of his contract with the reserves, he relocated to Texas. In late 2016, his wife gave him the motivation to go back to school to complete his degree, and so he did in spring of 2017. He is now pursuing a career as a secondary English language arts reading teacher. If timing and life allow it, he'd love to head back to Japan to contribute as a Dodds educator to his alma mater Zama High School or neighboring DODA schools. Welcome to the podcast, Jason. Thanks for having me, Nick. So you are our first Zama alum. So that's very exciting for me. To get, you know, we've yeah, had... I, I kind of feel like I have like a lot of pressure on me because I, you know, I'm, I'm like unofficially representing, you know, the Zama, Zama Trojans and whatnot, but um, hopefully I'll be able to, yeah, answer with, uh, yeah, just, you know, I'd be able to answer for all of us in a, in a neutral matter, you know. Yeah, definitely. There's no, no pressure, though. No pressure. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, for, first, I'm a, um alum. Uh, we'll talk a bit about, I, I think a lot of our conversation will revolve around sort of the Dodds and the DODA, because you're, you're still the second guest, I think, from one of the base schools. And I feel like there is definitely a disconnect between the international school community and then sort of the American base schools, even though we clearly have, you know, a long history in regards to relationships through co-curriculars, uh, you know, including mm-hmm. choir, as well as uh, all the sports. So um, first, though, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, what, what do you do? Uh, so we're actually right now, in, uh, about three weeks ago, we moved back up here to the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, we were in, uh, in a city called Galveston, Texas. Um, it's about an hour south of Houston. So we were on the coast, the Gulf Coast of, uh, of, uh, of Texas. Uh, my wife was there uh, for a, a physician assistant program, a graduate graduate program. So um, she's on her last three rotations. So that's why we moved up here to Dallas Fort Worth because that's where her last three rotations are. Mm-hmm. And so during that time, I was working on my my certification to become uh, a secondary educator um, due to the fact that you know we were just shut down due to the pandemic, and you know gave me some time to to work on it. So I'm. I got my applications out there. I'm just waiting, you know, to start teaching and try to give back to the younger community. Awesome. So you're, yeah. you're one of us, one of us. I'm okay. a teacher too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you grew up as, you know, being part of, I guess, sort of the uh, colloquial term is like uh, um, army brat, right? You yeah. were traveling around the world. Um, do you, why did your uh, parents end up at Zama? You know, um, it, it just starts with my dad. My dad was in the military. Um, 20, 20 plus years and uh, like I told you earlier he's retiring after another 20 years as a federal civilian with the Department of the Army so 40 years federal service and it, it's just his you know um, his line of work just kind of brought us there um, 
you know, for the Pacific side, he, he was in the military intelligence. Mm. So um, that job kind of opened up, you know, opportunities to go a lot more places for him. And before that, he was an infantryman. He really can't do much as a, as a grunt. So mm. he kind of changed um, military occupation. And um, it just so happened that, hey, he had the opportunity to go to, to Japan. But um, for me, uh, he initially told me we were going to Hawaii. Mm. So... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was pumped up about that, and then finally, and then I think last minute he said that we were going to Japan, and I didn't. I don't know of Japan. I don't know what where it's at. You know, all I knew was Hawaii because I was from there. My grandparents lived there. You know, and I just I have fond memories about Hawaii. So, um, you know, you were there from the John. Mm-hmm. I asked you earlier that the how to pronounce you it. You can the just John say R, 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 yeah, Arn Elementary, yeah, Arn Elementary. So, I mean, you spent quite a bit of your formative years in Japan. So what I'm really interested is for the, you know, kids at the bases, it's kind of like you live in this duality, right? Where on one hand, you're in America, right? Literally, it's American Mm -hmm. soil, Mm -hmm. but you're also in Japan. So with, you know, your classmates, as well as you, how much of that experience, what was it like being in the States? Was it really just like being in the States? And how much was it, you know, being in Japan? No, it, it was very minimal. Like it, it's you know we we knew we lived on within uh, within the fence lines of a military uh, property, mm-hmm. and we all spoke English. Mm-hmm. Um, we we had pizza, we had Burger King, we had you know all, all your typical food, but it just wasn't stateside for you know at all. I mean, um, you know, on we had what we call AFN, which is uh, American Forces or Armed Forces Network, which is like, you know, our TV channel, but we didn't have commercials. So for me personally, when I come back to the States like every few years and saw American commercials, I was pretty, pretty excited to see that. It's <laughs> something outside of your infomercials that we have, you know, on military bases and whatnot. So um, yeah, it just, it was, it gave us that comfort of like, knowing that, okay, we're surrounded by other Americans. Um, but at the same time, it, it wasn't totally, you know, it didn't feel like the U.S. It didn't feel like the U.S. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. You mentioned the food. I feel like that was always a big thing. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, when we were in high school, 2000s, or, you know, the people right before us in the 80s, 90s. It seems like some of that has shifted, though, huh, in the recent years, just because so much more of sort of these American types of food are... Uh, just readily available just internationally yeah. yeah for sure and you know um i think part of the other countries blame it for the increase in the bcd level too um in other countries where it, where it used to be not you know little to no exi- non-existent you know but you can say also on the flip end too like you know um i know first in california you probably know there's a big there was a big, you know, surge and in, in, uh, increase in, in Asian foods and Asian cultures and, and whatnot. And it's actually a lot, a lot of it is here in Texas too, believe it or not. That's true. That's true. I, 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 I think of a uh, television, right? I mean, even YouTube, I mean, this, yeah. I mean, we're, you know, relatively young people, but um, mm-hmm. I can recall uh, renting DVDs out during college, <laughs> right? Of like Japanese yeah. television shows. And that was a real treat. Uh, now yeah. it's just, everyone's streaming everything so uh right yeah. definitely very different times and within the you know the base schools so off the top of my head i i could think of yokota zama yokosuka were generally the schools that you know we regularly played sports with and then you know you had your kadinas um kubasakis mm-hmm. how much interaction was there within the different base schools was it kind of like the international schools and you guys kind of went to each other's bases or is it far more isolated yeah, we actually did. Um, we did go to other bases, you know, up north, Misawa. Misawa was up there. So we would, that would, it's like the, that and going to Okinawa. They're like long, long distance trips. So they're like trips that we look forward to as a, as a team um, to, uh, to visit and whatnot. And, um, and the trip to those other bases is, is a treat for us too. Um, because, yeah, we're familiar with our base and we're familiar with, visiting uh, parts of Japan that are like just, you know, right outside of the base and whatnot. Um, mm-hmm. But to see other places, 
more, you know, um, it, it was, it was like a treat for us too. So like, I didn't have a chance to ask, you know, Brendan was the only other guy, Brendan Lintz, uh, you know, from the bases, but I feel like within the international schools, there is sort of this like stereotype that we, you know, conjure up of each school. Like, you know, St. Mary's is sort of the macho, you know, all male school and say Santa is kind of a bit more preppier than sacred heart and, and so on. Um, were there kind of those stereotypes based on the bases? And I think that's even more interesting because there's already those stereotypes of the army, right? Navy, uh, air force. Did that ever sort of transition into the way people viewed students in each of the bases? I think, I, I think that's where it started for sure. The, the, the military branch of library, <coughs> excuse me. Um, you know, there's like that the, the very common army versus Navy football game and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, that was very much alive. And that just, just kind of, you know, I don't think the parents kind of pushed it on them, but it just naturally, it, just, it was just naturally there. Um, for Zama, actually though, we were, we went to school with Navy kids. So we had Camp Zama and then uh, we had surrounding like smaller housing areas like Sagami Depot. Sagami Depot and Sagami Hara. And then we had uh, Atsugi and Kamaseya. So like Atsugi was the Naval Air Station that was there, but they didn't have their own school. They had their own elementary school, but they didn't have their own middle school, secondary school. Mm -hmm. So they, we all got on buses and we all came to Zama and we, all, we were all just one kid. So that rivalry uh, was there in regards to like Army and Navy, like, like Zama and Yokosuka, like Zama and Yokosuka. Mm. Um, but a lot of the Navy kids were friends with the Yokosuka kids because, you know, their dads actually worked together. It's just that, you know, some dads lived in Mitsugi and some dads lived in Yokosuka, you know. So, but for us, it was, I think back then at least, the, the rival was between Zama and Yokosuka in regards to football. Um, okay. Yeah. So uh, there was a lot of competition, a lot of, a lot of drama <laughs> amongst the coaches and even amongst our coach and even the, the sports writer for the stars and stripes, you know, like, yeah, <laughs> I heard some stories about that, you know, drama going on, but yeah, it was definitely there for sure. So this is all transpiring. And, you know, um, I just sort of selfishly ask, ask how did ASIJ fall into all this mix? Like what, how did you guys view ASIJ? Honestly, for me personally, I saw the international schools as like, very approachable schools. I, mm. I've never had any issues, never saw, saw um, you know, uh, them as y'all as preppy or like, you know, snob nose or anything, just because, you know, we heard that there's some embassy kids that go to ASIJ. Um, but for me personally, I've never had any issues, you know, mm. with that. And honestly, the, the one thing I do remember about ASIJ is when you guys came over to play in our homecoming game, football game. Mm. And at the end of the game, yeah, we won, but y'all came up with like, such good sportsmanship and said, y'all congratulate us, y'all, and then y'all told us have a good homecoming. Like, mm -hmm. we just won, but you guys still have that part of a, of a champ to come over and, like, congratulate us and whatnot. And that meant a lot. That, that says a lot for a school, like, you know, international school. Like, if it was the flip side of with the other military school, the military base, so that's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> I see. That's really interesting. Yeah, it's. Uh, I guess it's almost the fact that we were more distant. It also helped that you know there was less of that. As you said there was almost this innate differences by the bases. You know, in regards mm -hmm. to what the militaries do already, and maybe right. that that's what created a lot of differences amongst you guys. But that's great to hear that ASIJ had mm -hmm. a good reputation. As you said, like it's funny how that. I mean, so that game would have been something like sixteen, seventeen years ago, right? But. It just goes on to show you that type of, you know, sportsmanship. That's the stuff people remember, right? They yeah. might not remember the exact yards you ran or, you know, who scored the winning touchdown, but they might remember yeah. that too. But, but they also <laughs> do remember, you know, things like sportsmanship. So you graduate Zama. You then head off to California. Um, as a, you know, a, a student who graduated the military base, is it sort of common practice that, um, you know, you go into the JR JROTC as well as the ROTC program? Would you say a lot of your classmates continue to sort of follow their, uh, you know, parents' footsteps in regards to being part of the military? Yeah, and I think there's some statistics out there that there's a good, good percentage that uh, majority of us do tend to uh, follow our, our parents' footsteps into the military, whether it be serving um, in uniform or out. 
you know, serving with the Department of Defense as a federal civilian or whatnot. Um, uh, and uh, I can tell you right now, a lot of the, the, the people that I, my, my fellow classmates that I graduated with did proceed to, to you know, uh, serve in the military. Um, there are some individuals that surprised me that actually joined the military because, you know, um, during all throughout high school, they didn't seem that type, you know. And, mm-hmm. and, and, and JROTC, uh, junior ROTC, it, it, it's something different from senior ROTC or like college level ROTC, mm-hmm. um, you know, JROTC. And a lot, majority of us joined, in, you know, that program because it, honestly, it's because we had, it was like an extracurricular like, activity that was there for us. You know, we get to compete in drill matches, um, you know, marksmanship, rifle marksmanship, and, you know, being able to show off our uniforms and whatnot. And it was more of a, of a, of, of a leadership program, you know, teaching you about leadership, taking responsibility and, uh, and whatnot, and working through your troubles and, what, and stuff like that. So a lot of us joined because of that. Um, it wasn't necessarily because we wanted to join the military, um, but some of us did have, an, you know, intentions of doing the military, such as myself. And, mm-hmm. um, it just, it, and it does help uh, if you do all four years, like, you know, ninth to 12th grade of junior ROTC, if you do it, decide to enlist in the military or even go on to uh, college level ROTC and it kind of puts you up on a, um, like enlisted wise, like you get to like get bumped up a pay grade or two or something like that. Mm. Um, College level, you know, you actually get to skip what you call like a, like a leadership camp of some sort between your freshman and sophomore year. You got to go to, I think, Fort Knox or something in Kentucky. You get to bypass all that if you do four years of JROTC in high school. So it has its benefits. And, you know, back overseas in Japan, it was, I don't know how else to put it, but like it was like kind of like the cool thing to do, you know, to be part of, yeah. um, not just football, basketball, and baseball. But when I came here to the U.S., it's a totally different, the, the children here or the students here see it as a, as a totally different program, you know. Um, mm. Some parents think that it's like a recruitment thing for like the military, which is not. Mm. Um, but uh, but yeah, for, for us, a lot majority of us did we did follow our parents' footsteps and going there. The ROTC program, my understanding is, you know, when you do it as a college student, there's the financial benefits, and I think that as a real benefit nowadays when you know we see some private schools i think the last time i checked like nyu is 75 grand a year right so mm-hmm. 300 grand for four years so i don't know if they have an rotc program so what what would be sort of the expected sort of scholarships or you know whatever you'd call it financial you know um i guess support one would receive if they were to be part of an rotc program yeah i mean you know they have uh two, three, four-year scholarships, um, depending on what year you came in. And for me, I transferred in as a, as a junior from a, from a senior, or junior college. So, and under that, uh, I was also the, the United States Army Reserves. Um, but, uh, I mean, it's, they practically pay for your whole tuition. Wow. Um, and then they give you a monthly stipend depending on if you're a freshman, sophomore, junior. It's not much, but, hey, you know, it's pocket money for you. Um, then you have your book money, um, yeah. and not to mention your your scholarship, your tuition that you're given. It gets you can write off, you can get tax refunded as well. Um, this is the tax, I guess. Um, which somebody failed to let me know. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> um, I you know that's some money I lost there, but um, but yeah. So they're they're you know they're pretty much paying for your whole tuition as, as your time there. So if you're going to NYU and you're, you're having to top up seventy five k for to attend, you know it, that's a good route. And I, honestly, the majority of the reasons, the, the main reason why a lot of students actually go into ROTC and college level is, is for that. It's for the tuition. It's for the the financial assistance that you get. Because um, uh, you, yeah, you're going to have to repay it all with time and service. Mm-hmm. But that's also being, that's also part of it. Like you got to kind of be smart about which job to pick. Like if you're going to pick a combat arms position, infantry, being in a tank or whatever, 
of course it's going to be the most dangerous job ever. So like, you know, let's yeah. sleep with our noggin here and say, okay, let's do, let's pick a job that's going to help me out. You know, you know, I know I'll get deployed, but you know, maybe I won't be, it won't be as dangerous, you know? So, that was going to be my question is, so what exactly is the expectation on the side of the military? Is it like a two-year contract, a five-year contract? What, no, what, what do they expect two, when you uh, So graduate? even if you do get like a two-year contract, a scholarship, it's not just two years of repayment as a certain time of service. It's like four years and then like another four years as a, as a reservist. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so technically your whole contract is eight years. Eight years, wow. Yeah, but your last four years is in active reserve, or you can you can choose to participate as an active reservist. Um, yeah, so and it, it depends too. Like at, at the time that you, you actually sign your contract to be, to get commissioned, so you mm -hmm. sign like two different. You get contracted. You sign a contract to be a, a scholarship recipient, and then you do a contract to actually say, okay, I'm, you're like you're taking the oath mm -hmm. um, to be an officer. Sometimes they're like, they ask you, okay, do you want to do an additional two years here? You know, so you can be guaranteed a job here kind of thing. Mm -hmm. They kind of play with the, the wording a little bit. And you really got to read that contract carefully. And, and I, you know, imagine not everyone pursues it all the way, right? Including yourself, right? At, at some point, you know, people mm -hmm. will drop out. So why, you know, what, why did you stop um, your ROTC and, and how common is it? And, and when that happens, um, do people just drop the ROTC alone or do they drop both? Um, I thought I was by myself in regards to the, the way I handled my, my, my situation. Um, but I've seen, going back to, I guess, your question, uh, I've seen many like what we call gung-ho cadets who are just like very active. They're, they're active academically, physically. They get... You know, they just do very well in, in all areas. But they soon realize after they do their initial contract and they get out as a captain, mm. um, it's just what it just wasn't for them. Like it some some of them say it's just they didn't agree with it politically. Mm. They didn't like the uh, the army mentality. Mm. Um, and that's a different thing too. Like even though the Army, Air Force, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, Navy were all under the Department of Defense. We actually we actually operate differently. Mm. Um, so uh, there's a thing going on about how the army is not really treating the soldiers very well. You know, taking care of them, and you know, it's so it's a you know, it's really de depending on where you're at, really. But uh, for me personally, uh, man, I just I just party a lot. <laughs> mm. I just party a lot in school. Um, I just wasn't taking it as serious as I thought. I just kind of like. Felt like everything was coming into place so I can just relax now. But that wasn't the case. I should have, you know, geared up and then kind of gone into the, you know, to the next level, you know, full, you know, full on. Don't slow down. Mm -hmm. So I was just so happy that I was in a position where I knew I was going to be an officer. Um, you know, I was in a good relationship at the time. And it just, you know, I thought everything was just there, you know, so mm -hmm. I could just relax. But I took it way too far. Mm -hmm. And um I just kind of slacked off and, you know, I, 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 what happened was I got sent to this is mandatory camp between your junior and senior year up mm. in Fort Lewis, Washington for 30 days. They test you on everything that they taught you. Squad tactics, platoon tactics, how to handle logistics movements and finding points on a map and physical fitness and physical fitness is what really got to me because before I had gone, I was just doing whatever I wanted. I was drinking a lot and, Mm. I was gaining weight and um, I took that physical fitness test three times yeah. and I've never failed a physical fitness test prior to that. Mm. And so um, they gave me three times to take it. And then uh, the, three days before graduation, they pulled me and they sent me back home. And wow. so, yeah, you just, you know, you just gonna have to come back next year. If, yeah. if you are even eligible to come back next year. So I came, I went back home and, uh, that's it. Just things just start falling apart. Yeah. Mm. It, that's and when that's just, when, yeah. Mm -hmm. I said that that's when you you take your prolonged break to 2011. And when so when when you made that decision, 
was was there any part of you thinking i want to go back to our you know the rotc so the military route or do you feel like at that point you were sort of already looking at other options yeah i was actually uh thinking about uh after i did my contract with the reserves kind of go into the navy hmm. i transitioned over to the branch of the navy um but just for some reason my own transition from you know, what had happened in ROTC, what happened in school, and not going to school all of a sudden, it just took a, it took a mental toll on me, right? Mm -hmm. And then, um, so my, my parents saw that, um, and it just so happened around that time is when uh, the whole tsunami and earthquake incident happened in Japan. Yeah. yeah. My parents were still there. Mm -hmm. um, so they were either told to evacuate to Korea where my, where my parents had family or here to the States. So mm -hmm. my mom decided not to move. I think she, she just wanted to be with the family. The family should stay together. And Camp Zama was, was, was far away from the, the nuclear area. So mm -hmm. it wasn't really effective. Um, but they, they realized, well, we lived in Japan for so long that we forgot to have a home base here in the States. Mm -hmm. And that's when uh, they decided to purchase a home around that time. And they said, look, we need somebody to be here in Texas. This, and this, this home right here, where I'm at right now, mm. um, they said, you know, why don't you come here and start a new chapter, start all over? And I took their offer and, and I've been here since and it's been a blessing. Wow. Yeah. So that was a decade ago, uh, more than yeah. a decade now. Mm -hmm. And so when you made that transition to Texas, um, that seems to be the big thing that right? we were talking about off air. It's what everyone's doing now the last uh, two years. Uh, what was that transition like from California to Texas? I drove in a, a 2005 PT cruiser <laughs> from California, from Northern California, went through Southern, took that, you know, the, the South, Southern route. And I felt like going through the deserts of New Mexico and Arizona was like, an, like, an, like a time for me to like, just everything's cleansed. Mm. You know, yeah, I do have my baggages, you know, there's always going to be memories of what had happened, but I felt like it was like literally a, a cleansing moment, you know, when I saw the mm. desert and then when I finally came into, when I saw the, the skyline of Dallas, I felt like, okay, this is, this is where I'm going to make it. This is where everything's going to come back to lots of place. And, and the transition um, was very good, right? I, my understanding is you, you, you met new people there, uh, including your wife. Uh, you know, who pushed you to go back to school. So what, what was that conversation like in 2016? I was scared, kind of, because I, I, I kind of told her I was, you know, like, I, 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 I did graduate with my bachelor's, and, um, but technically I, I didn't. And actually, I didn't find out I didn't graduate with a bachelor's until, um, I think, like, even after I walked. Because <laughs> mm. that's a different yeah. story now, but I thought, I assumed, you know, every, even though I had, wasn't doing very well i assumed my classes were at least they were, i was you know i passed enough to, to graduate but yeah. i didn't hear back till like after i got here to texas that oh shoot i'm, I'm not i'm technically not a graduate really? so I, i've yeah. been telling my wife that and i told my parents that too <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> um and then uh you know finally one day you know my wife she's no, no longer my, my girlfriend anymore fiance she's my wife and she needs to know and we didn't have our kid at the time. And, you know, she, and she was like, you know what? Like, I think this is a good time to go. Um, uh, it's only going to be a semester. Um, mm -hmm. She was busy with her work and, and she was going to school for her prereqs for her grad school and stuff like that. So she was kept busy as well. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I went back and I kicked his ass, I mean, kicked its ass. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I finished school and, you know, I was very you know, darn proud of it. And, mm -hmm. um, that's what I needed, you know, for her to be okay with it. And and do you um you know make this transition? Well, I guess you're in it right now, sort of the tail end of the transition of going into uh, the uh, teaching field. Is that something that was always in the back of your mind, or is it something that transpired, you know, post leaving the ROTC? It, it was something in the back of my mind because uh, even living in Japan, I, I was I attended a church there for a very long time. I was a, a, a Korean, it was like a Korean Japanese American church right off base of Sudan Hall, and uh, we were members of that church for a very long time. And there was a point where we didn't have a Sunday school teacher, 
Mm-hmm. So it was actually up to me to actually lead those kids, you know, in Sunday school and, and you know, Bible school and whatnot. And, uh, my parents and the parents of these children always came up to me and say, hey, you know, you're really good at mentorship. Mm-hmm. Um, and I absolutely love mentoring. I love being able to teach somebody who's new to something and see them excel and see them actually move on to better things. And that's the one thing I loved about being in the army is mentorship, mentoring new privates that come in and, um, you know, they're just kids, 17, 18 year olds, you know, and, mm-hmm. um, just kind of let them know that, you know, Hey, it's, 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 it sucks now, but you know, you learn from it, you know, kind of thing. And, yeah. Um, you know, even here in Texas, when I moved initially, I also, I was also a youth leader here at the church that we attend and, um, I eventually became a young adults leader for the college kids. You know, these, these kids, um, they call me, you know, uh, or Opa, you, you, you know, you know, you, being in Korea, you, you know, oh, Opa. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah Kama and Opa, right? <laughs> like older brother, you mm. know, like it kind of, it meant a lot because they, they're, they're gaining something from what I'm teaching them, you know, and, uh, I like that. I enjoyed seeing that. And, um, and my, my wife and my mom, my mother and, even my mother-in-law, they said, you know, you should really don't really think about teaching. And I kind of put it in the back burner because I thought, you know, like a typical Korean male, I should be working with Samsung and, you know, big conglomerate corporations like, like most Koreans do here, which I have done. I've tried, but I just cannot fit in very well with, with that environment. So I, so I finally said, let's do it. Let's teach. And I've substitute teach uh, taught down in Galveston for for the whole year, and I loved it. I said, mm-hmm. "Okay, this is it. This is I'm gonna be it. This is what I'm gonna do." Wow! So it, it's it's something you would have not had imagined like ten years ago, huh? No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ten years ago, my mind was just like, "Okay, let's try to get back into the military, 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 military," because that's what I was. That's what I grew up with, you know, seeing my dad in uniform and living on base and. Having that military ID card was like a, a, like a like you know as if a kid had his blankie. Well, it's it's good to hear that you joined the you know teaching. Um, I don't know if I can guarantee that it's a great industry. I'd like to say so though. <laughs> There's definitely ups and downs. Um, you know, this is the Tokyo Alumni Podcast. I want to sort of bring it back to uh, Zama, and I want to ask you. Um, this is a question I've been lately asking people: is what's one memory of Zama High School that you have? That you'd like to share um it's got to be community um, mm. the community is just we just we knew each other we all knew each other the base i guess is was kind of big um i guess it's one of the bigger army bases from what i can remember i'm not sure how big camp foster is being part of that community um the community was always so active um, and part of that the reason why i love the community is because of my friends a lot of us actually grew up together from elementary to graduation of high school. And actually before I moved back up here to Dallas, um, one of my high school friends that I went through elementary, middle school and high school, he got actually stationed down there in Galveston with the Army Corps of Engineers um, as a civilian. Mm. And he like kind of just, you know, hit me up one day randomly and said, hey, you know, Jason, I'm gonna be down there, I'm gonna be moving down and, um, you know, can you tell me a little about, you know, this stuff? And like, I was like, great, you know, I'm going to have another friend here that I've known for a long time. And, 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 and because of that, because I spent so much, uh, such a long time with a, a tight group of people, you know, I'm able to kind of like, you know, I guess communicate with them, you know, even further, even after graduation. Mm-hmm. You know, like that kind of gave me like, they're more, they're more like brothers and sisters than like friends. Yeah. Would you say um, a lot of the like of the graduating class, what percent uh, were there for all of high school, and what percent were you know all, all there middle school? Like, do you did you guys have a high retention rate, or were you kind of like these other international schools where there was a lot of kids coming in and out? You know, as a military, you would think that you know it's kids coming you know coming in and out, but I think because I think two things is because a lot of us were even the kids from the Navy base from Matsu. Hmm. They even actually spent a long time there too. They they attended their elementary school back on their base and started attending Zama and middle school and high school together. And then you have those families who actually moved 
um, you know, with their children at the start of their freshman year or their sophomore year. So mm. on average, you stay about two, three, maybe four years at each phase that you're at. So these guys, they actually grew up with us during the high school year, you know. So I really can't say, I can't give you a percentage, honestly, but I, mm-hmm. I would say majority of us have, are like, I would say Japan lifers, I guess you can say, from, from elementary to, to graduation to high school. And about how big uh, is the average graduating class at Tamo? Yeah. Uh, I think it's shrunk a lot from what I remember, but I know my class, uh, I think it was about 71 or 72. Mm, yeah. So that's it's a good number. Yeah. Oh, is it? I, I don't know how, what, what, you know, what your guys' numbers were. Well, I mean, like I was just thinking in regards to sort of that, you know, as you said, the community. So uh, ASIJ is, I think, usually about 110 to 130. Uh, oh, no. St. Mary's, Sacred Heart, Chase, and those schools are about, I think, similar to you guys, 60 to 90. But as you mentioned, I think that small, you know, that sort of 60 to 120, I'd say 60 to 100 is perfect in regards to like everyone knows everyone. Yeah. And that can get tedious and annoying sometimes. But especially now that we're older, I mean, I love it that I could, uh, and I'm sure you've had these conversations with other base kids where you meet someone who's a graduate of 2009, Yokota, mm-hmm. and they'll know at least 20 people, you know, or yeah. even though you're a Zama 2005. I right. think it's very similar with the international schools. And that's something I, you know, you, you talk to kids who graduate these big public schools in the States and it's like, you could be one school over, you know, five minutes away, <laughs> yeah. graduate the same year and you will have no one, you know, zero mutual friends or zero, yeah. you know, zero people, you know, and I feel like that's a very sort of special thing we get to have as this mm-hmm. uh, you know, Tokyo alumni, yeah. you know, or I guess Kanto alumni. <laughs> for being more uh specific there uh and at the end here i like to ask uh guests what is to come uh near future and long future so you know what's up in the next few years as well as what's kind of the coming decades for uh jason well um you know i'm fingers crossed to hopefully start teaching full-time uh, my wife is at, her, at the, the end of her leg of uh her, her, her final year as a PA student so hopefully she'll get, you know, I know she'll graduate, you know, I know she'll graduate and, you know, this is something she's been working on for a very long time too, since, since we met uh, before dating. And so I know this is something that she's really aimed for and, you know, she's worked hard for, um, you know, and I think we just kind of see ourselves here for the next few years, kind of get settled down and um, get things rolling. And you know, we, we, we often talk about going out of state too, you know, living out of state and, he talks about Hawaii all the time, <laughs> you know, yeah. but we all, you know, we all know it's expensive and, you know, with the pandemic going on still ongoing, it is mm-hmm. still ongoing, you know, and so, um, you know, we just kind of got to wait and see actually to see what goes, but, you know, we're, we're comfortable with Texas and, you know, this is where we're going to be at. You know, our son was born here in Texas and we have family here now in Texas. So it's probably going to be here for, for, for quite a while. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I, as you said, the pandemic's ongoing. I feel like this is a po- pandemic podcast because I started at the start of the pandemic. Uh, oh, okay. feels much better now, though, in comparison uh, to the earlier <laughs> episodes where we were like, what is going on? Yeah, now yeah. The vaccine and the, the end is near. Um, exciting to hear, yeah, about your transition as well as your, 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 uh, your wife. So you're both sort of going to be entering new chapters professionally. Right. And, um, yeah, it was really interesting talking to someone from Zama. Uh, for God, I don't know how long. It's been a while. <laughs> really? Well, I mean, I hope I answered all your questions, you know. And, and again, like, I, these are all from my point of view, from how I saw it. And, um, you know, a lot. We're, we're, I know a lot of other kids or a lot of, actually, I shouldn't say kids anymore because we're like in our 30s now. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, the other, the other classmates, you know, they've had different experiences as well. And, That'd be great, man. It'd be great to yeah, get more of that base representation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was episode 68, uh, Tokyo Alumni Podcast. Again, thank you so much, Jason, for joining us. And uh, hopefully I'll see you somewhere sometime post-pandemic. <laughs> okay. That's great, man. Thanks.